Good evening, I'm Andrew Chang. Tonight, the story that has gripped the world plays out in a courtroom and a church. That's amazing to me that he touched so many people's hearts. George Floyd is remembered. Three former cops are arraigned. I'm Adrian Arsenault. Also tonight, the conversation about policing here in Canada. The force they use, the funding they get, questions about the way forward. And since you're from Canada, I won't have a 21-second gap before I say what I have to say. Sharpton throws shade at the Prime Minister. That issue is here. And from darkness, a new beginning. I'm happy, I'm proud, I'm excited. Reviving the past for future generations. This is The National. It's been more than a week of upheaval in the United States. Large and largely peaceful protests punctured by scenes of violence and vandalism and a shocking presidential threat of military intervention. You will hear tonight about how calls for racial justice echo in this country. While the U.S. grapples with the question, has anything changed from leaders there? A growing belief it has. Some in politics and in the military sounding the alarm. Some civil rights leaders sounding the advance. All in agreement. Their country is at a crossroads. We begin tonight with Susan Ormiston in Minneapolis, where a memorial for George Floyd became a moment of mourning and marking a legacy. Susan? We are again at the shrine to George Floyd, and it's the busiest it's been all week. It's hard to imagine, Adrian, that a week ago tonight, downtown Minneapolis was in flames. In another part of this city today, at a university chapel, they gathered to remember the man who died just around that corner. As much as civil rights revival as a memorial, George Floyd's death has galvanized a rare opportunity for change, thundered Reverend Al Sharpton in an emotionally charged eulogy. What happened to Floyd happens every day in this country, in education, in health services, and in every area of American life. It's time for us to stand up in George's name and say, get your knee off our necks. The civil rights activist blamed Floyd's death on the illness that spread through the American justice system. He did not die of common health conditions. He died of a common American criminal justice malfunction. The family's attorney, Ben Crump, aimed his appeal at all Americans, urging them to continue to speak out for justice as they have this past week. Do not cooperate with evil. Protest against evil. Join the young people in the streets protesting against the evil, the inhumane, the torture that they witnessed on that video. Outside, hundreds gathered, listening on loudspeakers. Many families with young children pausing after a tumultuous week. Michael Smith wanted to be here to mark the moment. In a community standing together finally, if we continue just to do these things, we can have such a big change, it, it, it almost be revolutionary. 11-year-old Ariana Phipps has drawn her own conclusions. It's just really sad because it's racism and like all, everybody should be treated the same way. You changed the world, George. We gonna keep marching, George. We George Floyd's casket will accompany his family as they go home to Houston over the weekend for a family funeral there on Tuesday. We gonna keep fighting, George. We done turn the clock, George. We gonna... With Reverend Sharpton's words ringing in their ears. Adrian, in another part of Minneapolis today, at the very moment that memorial was going on, those three officers charged with aiding and abetting murder were in court for the first time. Judge said a $750,000 bail for each of them, and thus begins this long road of prosecution of these cases in court. All right, Susan, thank you very much. Now, before he spoke at Floyd's memorial service, Al Sharpton took a dig at Justin Trudeau while telling a Radio-Canada reporter his message to mourners. 
this is the tipping point for changing how policing is going to be done in America. And I'm going to be forthright in that. And since you're from Canada, I won't have a 21 second gap before I say what I have to say. So that was a reference to Trudeau's pause earlier this week when asked about Donald Trump's threat to use the army to quiet protests. Trudeau was asked today if he didn't criticize Trump because he's worried about offending him. My job as Prime Minister is to stand up for Canadians' values, uh, to express those values, uh, and to ensure uh, that I'm standing up for Canadians' interests as well, and I'm defending those interests. Now, how to best uphold those values and interests may turn on how things unfold in the U.S. Capitol. Paul Hunter is in Washington, where protest in the streets was felt in the corridors of power. On the grounds around the White House complex, a wall of a kind. After days of protest in the U.S. Capitol, more barriers went up today. But amid that, signals the demonstrations are having another effect. After Donald Trump's former Secretary of Defense, James Mattis, yesterday tore into Trump's threat to call in the U.S. military and subdue the protesters, today, support for those protesters from a string of senior Trump military officials, the chief of the National Guard, the secretary of the Army, the chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, each underlining they stand by Americans' right to assemble and be heard. Today, Trump's current secretary of defense sent home from D.C. federal troops that had been on standby. Trump, increasingly isolated, is reportedly not happy. On Capitol Hill today, Democratic senators with fully nine minutes of silence, the length of time George Floyd had that knee on his neck. And from Trump's own party. We have wounds from racism that have never been allowed to heal. Republican Senator Lisa Murkowski today called the maddest pushback on Trump necessary and suggested she may not support Trump for re-election. For his part, Trump tweeted, Mattis is overrated. Hours later, Trump retweeted his own tweet again. Meanwhile, Trump's attorney general criticized for ordering pushback on demonstrators today on the issue at the root of all the protests, America's racial divide. It is undeniable that many African Americans lacked confidence in our American criminal justice system. This must change. Our Constitution mandates equal protection of the laws and nothing less is acceptable. And in Virginia today, tangible change for what so many see as a symbol of hate and racial oppression. The contentious statue of Confederate General Robert E. Lee, this week covered in graffiti, now soon to be removed from its podium altogether. It's time to heal, ladies and gentlemen. Richmond is no longer the capital of the Confederacy. And tonight we're not out on the streets of D.C. because a huge thunderstorm rolled in this evening. But it's worth underlining what we've heard in conversation with demonstrators all week. In terms of real, meaningful change, it's lost on no one. Make noise now, make headlines now, demand change now, but vote in November. The presidential election is coming up fast. And we were told again and again this week that is when change will really come. Mark your calendar, Andrew. Okay. Paul Hunter in Washington. Thanks. Now, as protesters call for justice for George Floyd, another case was in court today. Those accused of murdering Ahmaud Arbery earlier this year in Georgia, unarmed and out for a jog. Arbery was followed and killed by white residents. The court learned that one of them was heard uttering a racial slur over Arbery's body after allegedly shooting him. Though the incident was captured on video, widely viewed, it took more than two months before the three suspects were charged. The concerns being raised south of the border about racism and policing are fueling a conversation here in Canada about redirecting funding from police to other services. Katie Nicholson now with recent cases bringing those questions into focus. A man staggers in the middle of the road Monday night only to be knocked down by a police vehicle. The RCMP officer behind the wheel now removed from the community and under two investigations. In New Brunswick, a well-being call last night ended with an Indigenous woman shot to death after police say she attacked the officer with a knife. 
while her community in B.C. grapples with its loss. We need answers. And in Toronto last week, a black woman in mental distress falls to her death after police were called to her apartment. That death leading to calls to redirect police funding to improve social services for black and indigenous communities, something known as defunding police. It's looking at the full policing apparatus and looking at alternatives to the services that are provided by police. It's something the mayor of L.A. says he's willing to do, cut around $100 million to address needs in the black community. So what we're asking for is to imagine different remedies, different sort of uh, systems that can be put in place to, to, to still ensure all of our collective safety while not putting others at risk. Today, the Prime Minister was asked whether he might consider a similar measure for the RCMP. We need to look at what's appropriate in Canada, how we can best keep Canadians safe and how we can best address the systemic racism. But the Canadian Police Association says forces across Canada already rely on specially trained civilian units for things like mental health calls more than ever before. The very thing that they're calling for is exactly what we're doing in policing in this country. Could we do more? Sure. Could we, you know, sh do we need to get better at it? Absolutely. But will Canada's police forces be willing to part with a chunk of their budget? When asked point blank today, Toronto's police chief said to make such a cut at this moment in time would be naive. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. Video of an arrest in Laval, just north of Montreal, has drawn widespread criticism. A man says he was targeted and was subject to excessive force because of his race. But Laval police say not so at all. Here's Alison Northcott. This video, shot last week, has been circulating online, showing Laval police pulling a man out of a car by his hair onto the ground. It's hard for Samuel to relive those moments. He spoke with CBC News. We agreed not to use his last name because he fears harassment. I'm traumatized, you know. It's like very hard for me. And I'm very stressed. I can't sleep at night too. And I'm even scared to go outside. He believes he and his friends were pulled over because they're black. He says police checked their ID and told them to get out of the car, then eventually pulled him out. Are they going to kill me? Or do I have to defend myself for, for them not to kill me or something, you know? Like, that's really what was on my mind. Laval police say the car was stopped for erratic driving, that the officers told Samuel multiple times over several minutes to get out because they suspected there were drugs inside, but he refused. They say it wasn't racial profiling. The men were ticketed for not social distancing and Samuel could face charges, including assaulting a peace officer. The way he was treated by that police officer with such disdain, Former police officer Will Prosper sees it as another example of young black men targeted. You feel like you're excluded and you just finish by developing a frustration of a system that doesn't do anything for you. Nobody cares for you and that's the feeling that we're having. I've been intercepted over a hundred times for random checkups. He says until the system changes, young black people need to know how to survive those interactions. They need to know that when a police officer stops you, even though you, you know you did nothing, you put your window down, you give your papers. Samuel's lawyer says he plans to file a civil suit against the officers involved. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Now, you might think one good solution would be mandatory body cameras for police officers. Well, Toronto's top cop seems to think so. Today, he endorsed them, but the evidence isn't so clear. Thomas Degler explains. Button. In the U.S., it's common for police body camera video to tell a story. Like when this officer caught children falling out of a burning building. I got him, I got him, go! Oh. Or when these officers were recorded punching a man who was apparently having a seizure. So in Canada, while the cameras are rare, the calls for them are becoming frequent especially since the recent death of Regis korczynski paquet in Toronto. It's led more than 85,000 people to sign this online petition, demanding Toronto police use body cameras. It will 
install more accountability after the fact. So this officer is, is uh, wearing his camera. Canada's biggest municipal police force showed off the devices as they announced a pilot project a full five years ago. Now under renewed pressure, the chief says officers will start being equipped by September, though the force hasn't chosen a vendor yet. Having those body-worn cameras will help give an objective account of that situation in those moments, and it's critical. Most Canadian agencies have resisted, but in Calgary, all frontline officers are equipped with body cams. Now Montreal's mayor wants them too, even after police there cited a $24 million annual price tag. From this researcher, a warning. The knee-jerk band-aid solution right now, it's not, it's not going to change anything. We're going to have these issues down the road because there's problems between police and the community. It's not the body camera that can fix it. The cameras may be coming, but there's much more that requires focus. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. Six weeks after a mass murder killed 22 people in rural Nova Scotia, the RCMP released new details about how the shootings unfolded and about a confrontation that claimed the life of RCMP Constable Heidi Stevenson. Kayla Hounsel has that. To get it right takes time. The RCMP says it wants to set the record straight on information that has been circulating about the mass shooting. Last month, the Mounties said witnesses described Gabriel Wortman pulling over two of his victims in his fake RCMP cruiser. Today, police say that was not the case. I'm very confident and I'm convinced, uh, based on that uh, witness information, that the gunman was not pulling over vehicles. Officers also provided more information about this crash between the gunman and Constable Heidi Stevenson. They say she did not ram his fake RCMP cruiser, but rather collided with his vehicle while he was driving the wrong way down a one-way road. They exchanged fire. She was wearing body armor at the time. Still, he killed her and took her weapon. He also had four other weapons, all obtained illegally, three in the United States, one in Canada. What I'll tell you is that uh, we do know uh, who provided weapons uh, to the gunman. The force says it is working with international law enforcement partners to determine whether any charges will be laid in relation to how Wortman obtained the guns. The RCMP's Behavioral Analysis Unit is trying to determine his motive. They call him an injustice collector. One who held on to conflict or differences with others, turning them inward until they boiled over in rage. The Mounties say they may never uncover all of the details about why the gunman went on a rampage, setting fires and killing 22 people. But they say they are committed to providing as many answers as possible for the victims' families and all Canadians. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. Some other stories we're following tonight on The National. After a powerful landslide yesterday swept eight houses into the sea off northern Norway, several minor slides followed, prompting evacuations. Incredibly, police say no one was injured. And police in Hong Kong tear gassed and arrested several protesters as thousands of people gathered in defiance of a ban to mark the 31st anniversary of the Tiananmen Square massacre. Last month, China announced new national security laws to tighten its control over Hong Kong. Washington is putting Canada on notice tonight. If Huawei is allowed on this country's 5G cell phone network, the U.S. State Department could review what intelligence it shares with Ottawa. Katie Simpson has the details. Canada has been weighing the risks of working with Huawei for more than a year and a half. And yet, still no decision. Today, something new to think about from the U.S. Greenlight, the Chinese tech giant to help build Canada's 5G network and risk consequences. We'll have to make an assessment if we can continue sharing intelligence with countries um, who have Huawei inside their most sensitive uh, technology and their most sensitive national security areas. Washington argues Huawei is a national security threat as it can be forced to act as a spy agency for the Chinese government claim the company denies. There, there's no evidence that the senior leadership of Huawei has particularly close relationships uh, with the China government. 
But Canada's intelligence partners, members of the Five Eyes Alliance, have either banned or are working to remove Huawei from developing the next generation technology. Prime Minister. The UK had originally said it could play a limited role, but is now reversing course after the US added an additional layer of pressure. Washington announced dramatic sanctions targeting the company, which will make it harder for Huawei to secure the supplies it needs. We continue to work with our security services and intelligence agencies on uh, the right path forward for Canada. With the sanctions and fresh pressure, Canada may have little choice but to follow its allies. Canada is an intelligence-consuming country, and without intelligence from the United States, we would be very much in the dark. Here in the U.S., Republicans and Democrats both support a ban on Huawei in 5G networks. So that pressure will continue. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. New Brunswick has recorded its first death due to COVID-19. Until now, the province has avoided the worst of the disease. Up next, how the province is fighting a new outbreak. Plus, Meghan Markle speaks out on the George Floyd protests. You are going to lead with love. You are going to lead with compassion. Her message to grads in her hometown, Los Angeles. And a reason to march for this brother and sister. Same parents, same opportunities, yet so many things are so different. We're back in two. Now to the pandemic and new findings about Canada's coronavirus hotspots from the chief public health officer. Quebec and Ontario account for the vast majority of cases overall, and community transmission hotspots persist in and around the Toronto and Montreal areas. So across Canada tonight, there are more than 93,000 cases, almost 7,700 deaths, including the first in New Brunswick. So it happened this morning in Campbellton, and Harry Forrestell has the details. It was the news New Brunswickers had been dreading the province's first death due to COVID-19 and the end of an enviably clean slate. Yesterday, an individual aged between 80 and 89 with underlying health conditions passed away at the Camelton Regional Hospital as a result of COVID-19. The individual, 84-year-old Daniel Willette, he'd been living at a special care home until Friday when he was diagnosed with COVID-19. It's no joke, says his son, Michel. This is a virus that nobody understands, that comes and gets you, and you don't even know it. The region wasn't in the COVID crosshairs until two weeks ago. The first cases were tied to a local doctor. He'd traveled to Quebec to fetch his four-year-old daughter and failed to self-isolate when they returned to Campbellton. Public health workers scrambled, tracking down the estimated 150 people he and his daughter had contact with since their return including a care worker at the home Willette lived in. It's unfortunate what had happened. The doctor has explained, and he, he also said that he, he, there was a misjudgment of it on his behalf. Was it that it was a matter of time for us or a matter of time for any region to, to, uh, to, to catch this virus? Today was a day of mixed emotions. New Brunswick's first death from COVID-19 is a sobering event. But in other parts of the province, the lifting of COVID restrictions brings badly needed relief after nearly three months of lockdown. Harry Forrestell, CBC News, Fredericton. Now, when it comes to COVID-19 and pets, there's a lot we still don't know. But businesses that serve our furry friends sure are taking the virus seriously. Take a look. COVID-19 has turned the lives of people upside down, but it's also affected our pets. So whether you're going to the groomer or a doggy daycare or a visit to the vet or leaving them with a walking service, what should you expect? So the client comes in, stands on the green mat. Miss Miss they unclip their dog. The dog goes running through the back to hang out with his friends. He's so excited. We'll see you this afternoon. And then they leave. When it's time for the client to come back to pick up their dog, the dog walks out to the owner, the owner clips the dog, and off they go. So a distanced pickup and drop off. Another rule that many facilities have is that you have to remove personal items from your pets. So no leashes, for example, you have to take them off when you arrive. And another common rule, only one owner on the premises at a time. 
From staff, the biggest changes you'll notice, they may be wearing protective equipment, there will certainly be more physical distancing, and they may try to stagger their appointments, spread them out, so just be sure to call ahead of time. But overall, not much else changes because COVID-19 is overwhelmingly transmitted between humans. And it would be unlikely that the dog fur would have, you know, a heavy contamination of the virus. And even if the dog were plague, it's probably unlikely that that virus would get transmitted to be on the coat of the other dog. So, I mean, these are extremely low uh, probability events. Low probability, but not zero. So while there isn't a standing recommendation to say, bathe your pets more often, you should still be practicing good hand hygiene. But at the end of the day, an epidemiologist's take on how safe these services are? The risk of transmission in those settings is going to be extraordinarily low. Well, still ahead on The National, a special program to teach teachers. I'm happy. I'm proud. I found myself more. Like this more of my identity. Introducing the grads of the first Dene language teaching program. But first, Rosie's here with that issue. Andrew, tonight we're talking about the political reaction to Trump's response to the protest, the Prime Minister's silence, the calls for action, and the state of the Canada-U.S. relationship. That's up next with Chantal, Andrew, Althea, and Elamy. I'd like to ask you what you think about that, and if you don't want to comment, what message do you think you're sending? We all watch in horror and consternation what's going on in the United States. It felt longer that time, but it was a 21-second pause where the Prime Minister chose not to condemn the U.S. president specifically in his handling of the protests against police brutality and anti-black racism. So what does his response, or perhaps more importantly in this instance, his silence tell us? It's Thursday, and I'm here with At Issue. Chantal Hébert, Andrew Coyne, Althea Raj, and my Party Lines co-host, Elamine Abdul-Makhmoud. This allows us to promo the podcast uh, as well, Elamine. Thank you all for being here. Uh, so there's been a a lot of talk, obviously, of that about that pause, whether it was real, whether it was planned, how we should interpret it. So I just want to go around the horn and see what everyone thought of it. I'll start with you, Chantal. Oh, thank you. Um, I didn't think uh, it was planned. How can you plan a 21-second pause, uh, looking the way you look, uh, thinking your way through? I thought the question had an interesting curve in it, which may explain how long the pause was. I'm sure that Justin Trudeau and many of us would have felt better if he'd come out swinging. I'm not so sure that once he would have done that, we would all have felt that anything much was accomplished. So that's where I am. Uh, Elamine, I'll, I'll go to you now. What, uh, what, what do you think, why do you think he, he answered in that way or, or let that silence sort of be part of the answer? I mean, to me, it was going to be a mystery no matter what he was going to say, because it's not like he can really take that, the high ground in this. Um, it's not like people have forgotten about the blackface incident. It's not like people have forgotten about the fact that, you know, they rolled out this massive um, anti-racism strategy, but then they forgot to, you know, double the funding that they said they were going to do. So there's there's not a lot of points that he can kind of drive home as, as, as a difference. So I think, you know, going quiet was... Um, searching, struggling for an answer, and it kind of makes sense. It kind of showed. And, and Andrew, all the people demanding that uh, the prime minister call out Donald Trump and condemn him directly, what, what, what should what should they have expected? I do think you have to pick your spots, particularly when you are uh, in government as opposed to, let's say, an opposition MP. Um, and you have to ask yourself at all times what's going to be accomplished by this. Uh, he did speak on the broader issue of racism and policing, and more generally. Uh, I think he would have certainly been remiss, even allowing for some of his own blind spots on that, he would have been remiss if he didn't. But the specific criticism of, of Trump, you knowing what how mercurial, to use one word, he is, uh, I think you, 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 you have to ask yourself what's going to be accomplished here. It's not as if other people aren't uh, um, denouncing Trump. Mm -hmm. If you were dealing with a situation where we weren't dealing with a democracy, for example, where if we don't, if we in the broader community outside of that country don't talk about it, nobody will, 
that would be one thing. But this is something where people are certainly denouncing Trump enough. Yeah, and I'm, when when our my colleague Tom Perry asked that question, because it was my CBC radio colleague Tom who, who did ask that question, I mean, I think he was uh, wondering whether this would be an instance where the prime minister would change his strategy in dealing with the president. A lot of people, um, including uh, in liberal circles, believe that the prime minister has uh, a penchant for the dramatic and that this was a planned uh, response. The prime minister's office official answer is that the prime minister was thinking about his answer and then gave it. And today he was asked about that a little bit. And he said that basically he takes his responsibility to Canadians seriously. Um, and I think we can't forget what happened at the G7 in 2018, where the prime minister just had a regular press conference where mm -hmm. uh, in the, the, the background being the tariffs on steel and aluminum. And he said it was a bit insulting that Canada had been uh, lumped in with other countries and then all hell broke loose. And so I think that there is a certain let's walk on eggshells when it comes to Donald Trump, because nobody knows what the president is going to do. It, it, it did, though, offer an opportunity to do something that other political leaders in Canada have said would have been needed, and that's Jagmeet Singh, the, the first person of color who leads a federal party. I want to play a clip of him. The silence is deafening. The Prime Minister of Canada has to call out the hatred and racism happening just south of the border. And if the Prime Minister can't do that, how can everyday people be expected to stand up? I mean, obviously, when you're not in government, Elamine, it, it, it's easier to point out these things. But uh, is there something to what, what Jagmeet Singh is saying, too? Uh, certainly, totally, there is. You know, like, I understand that the Prime Minister would go on the next day and say that part of the pause is that he has a responsibility to Canadians, but he also has a responsibility to, when he sees something as egregious as what's happening in the U.S., kind of call it out and name it. Um, and, and for him to sort of shy away from that, I think, actually doesn't fit with the image that he's trying to build for himself. Like, that was sort of like a, sort of a really easily missed shot, because I think he spent a lot of time trying to be you know, the guy who, who will take on those answers. Um, and in that moment, he just completely went quiet. And he was sort of, he was sort of slapped around a bit today, Andrew Coyne, by Al Sharpton, too, who said, uh, you know, I'm not going to wait, make you wait for my answer. But I wonder if there was a moment there that, that he missed. Well, uh, I, he did speak, as I understand it, to the, the broader issue of, yes, as I say, racism and policing and racism more generally. And he also took care to turn the, and he took flack for this, for to say, to say that we cannot... Uh, um, um, lecture from too high a horse in Canada, maybe a slightly higher horse than the United States, but we have our own problems with that here. And some people took him to task for that. I thought it was entirely appropriate. Uh, I think this was a point that a lot of people were making, was that this is a far broader problem than people want to admit. So uh, I know I'd like to be able to dump on him on this, but <laughs> I really don't. But last word to you, Althea. I think Green Party leader, actually, she's no longer the Green Party leader, Green Party parliamentary leader, Elizabeth May, probably uh, said it best when she recognized this week that she has a role to play when she was speaking about herself and Jagmeet Singh uh, condemning what was what we were seeing in the United States by the president, um, but that the prime minister has a role to play as well and that everybody knows each other's responsibility and she was going to shy away from criticism uh, of Justin Trudeau and Christia Freeland because um, she recognizes that they're dealing with the unpredictable. And frankly, I think what is more concerning this week is that the prime minister uh, would not denounce what he saw in the video in uh, Nunavut with the Inuk man who was clearly uh, struck by a truck and five RCMPs pinned him to the ground, um, that he is refusing to uh, come out with a national action plan, uh, the 231 call to actions from the uh, inquiry on missing well, he's, women he's and de girls. He's delaying. He's not refusing. He's, he's delaying, delaying it. it. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. say it's because of the pandemic. Okay, we're going to take a short break, but we get another round of that issue right after this. We'll take a closer look at just uh, that state of the Canada-U.S. relationship. Will we ever go back to normal or a new normal or something? That's next. Even as some of our allies, including the United States, seem to withdraw from the world, Canada is engaging in strong and confident ways, as Canadians expect us to. The United States' role on the global stage has changed over the past few years, as has its relationship with Canada, but a lot, actually, just over the past few months. Where do things stand between the two now? Chantal, Andrew, Althea, and Elamine, all back for another round of that issue. I'll, I'll, I'll admit here that we sort of stole this notion from Aaron Weary's column about the relationship and it changing. But when you hear the, the Prime Minister, and I'll start with you, Andrew, talking about how the United States has stepped back 
and presumably looking for ways for Canada to step in as sort of a middle power. Um, is there any possibility our relationship gets better uh, or changes more dramatically? Uh, not until after Trump is gone, certainly. Uh, the question is, after he's gone, what replaces him? Let's assume they lose uh, in the election in November. Uh, some of the, the American position that prior to Trump is never going to come back. They are not going to come back, I don't think, to the same kind of position of world leadership uh, that they occupied before, partly because uh, they don't want to and partly because the rest of the world perhaps doesn't want them to. So there is going to be a new normal in that sense, in a multilateral sense. Um, I'm not so sure that we can't reestablish a bilateral relationship in terms of our own continental affairs that isn't much more approximately close to what we had before. Uh, we have the NAFTA in place, or whatever you want to call it now. Um, I think there remains you know, huge reservoirs of goodwill on both sides of the border. Chantal, what do you think? I um, have watched this relationship ebb and flow when we declined to join the U.S. in Iraq. Lots of people wrote about how things would never be the same, and then Barack Obama came around. And even with Stephen Harper in power, the relationship was fairly sound. So I, I tend to treat the Trump years for however long they will be as an anomaly. Uh, but before thinking that the world uh, is going to shift in significant ways because the U.S. will not be um, taking on the leadership role that it had in the past, this, no matter what the result of the American election, I pause to think, uh, who then? That's a good point. Uh, Althea. Uh, you know, it sounds like an echo chamber here. I think that uh, we all agree that the relationship between Canada and the U.S. Um, will outlast whoever the occupant of the White House is, and that things will probably recalibrate themselves come November if um, Joe Biden wins. Um, and if uh, Donald Trump continues on, then the Prime Minister has uh, developed a functional relationship, and that will continue. Um, what it means for our role on the international stage, I think it's still not clear exactly what role Canada wants to play. We're very good at lip service and talking about things that are important to us and that are values-based. Um, but when it actually comes to deliverables um, or taking you know, hard and tough decisions, we seem to shy away from making those decisions. So I don't know. Time will tell. As John Manley says, oh. said, you know, when yeah. the bill comes due, we excuse ourselves to go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Elamine, you have to try and top that as the last word. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but my curiosity is just like how long the pandemic keeps the borders closed, because I think that does change the, the calculus that we have. So, you know, the longer that border stays closed, uh, the longer that uh, the relationship is at least like a little bit strained. Um, and, and while we're trying to manage Donald Trump while he's in office, yeah, that's a problem. But if we go, you know, seven, eight months with this border closed, I don't know if anyone's talking about that or not, um, then I think that does change our standing when it comes to the U.S. Okay, we'll leave it there. Thank you all. Appreciate you being here. Elamine, thanks for doing double duty uh, this week, having to spend extra time with me. Appreciate it. We'll see the rest of you next week. Uh, and before we go, be sure to check out the Party Lines podcast. That's where you can find Elamine and I every week. This week, we talk about uh, that debate around defunding the police. Uh, catch that conversation on any major podcast app. For now, though, it's back to Adrian and Andrew in Toronto. Next on The National, making history by keeping theirs alive. Meet the grads of the first ever Dene language teachers program and hear what they want to bring to the classroom. But first. In case you missed it, this Washington DC man is being hailed as a hero for opening his door to dozens of strangers. This was the scene outside his home Monday night. Police had boxed in a group of peaceful protesters and were moving it. They were just spraying pepper spray into people on their backs. So Rahul Dubey yelled for protesters to just get in the house. We had to keep the door open and just kept grabbing people and pulling them in. <coughs> and once inside, Dubey says people were coughing, crying, splashing milk on their faces to mitigate the effects of tear gas and pepper spray as police waited outside. What happened here was an amazing group of people ranged from 50 years old to 18 years old that were gathered here peacefully and were absolutely decimated and beaten on the steps of my house. The protesters stayed there all night long, emerging only when curfew lifted at 6 a.m. But some returned later, bringing food, water, offering rides home to some protesters and to Dubai, offering a lot of gratitude.
In this season of graduations, one in Saskatchewan's in a class all of its own. 21 brand new teachers who can work in their Dene language. Bonnie Allen explains. Nestled in the boreal forest of northern Saskatchewan on the Clearwater River Dene Nation, Cora LeMegg is making history. She went to high school on this reserve and this fall she'll be back in the classroom as a certified teacher and speaking her traditional Dene language. I'm happy, I'm proud, I'm excited. Even more remarkable, she didn't have to leave home to get her Bachelor of Education. Her classes included lessons in Dene culture and language. Who are we as Dene people if we do not speak our Dene tongue? She's one of 21 teachers to graduate from the Dene Education Teacher Program. Across Canada, Indigenous languages are disappearing. <laughs> The Clearwater River School teaches Denny immersion from kindergarten to grade 12, but it's been tough to find teachers. A university program in the community was a long shot. But then, one of Canada's deadliest school shootings. In 2016, a high school student in Laloche went on a shooting rampage, killing four people, wounding seven others. With the shooting, I think governments felt obliged to help out with a unique program like this. A free four-year program, Rena Lameg signed up. Before the program started, I was feeling lost. The students learned from elders out on the land and from professors who traveled north. Ferris Lameg can now speak, read, and write Dene. I found myself more, like this more of my identity. Language, culture, and identity are entwined, so these new teachers will be teaching the next generation so much more than words. Bongo. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Regina. And next on The National, why they march. It can start with one person, but it can turn out to be something special, so why not let it be yourself? Two teens with a message in our moment. But first, Meghan Markle's message to the graduating class at her former L.A. high school about how they can help fix the problems now on display. Now you get to be part of rebuilding. And I know sometimes people say, how many times do we need to rebuild? Well, you know what? We are going to rebuild and rebuild and rebuild until it is rebuilt. Because when the foundation is broken, so are we. You are going to lead with love. You are going to lead with compassion. You are going to use your voice. You are going to use your voice in a stronger way than you've ever been able to. Because most of you are 18 or you're going to turn 18, so you're going to vote. In the skies over Halifax today, a symbol of solidarity. Pilot Dimitri Neonakis says he flew 330 nautical miles in the pattern of a clenched fist. This is the same pilot who flew in a heart shape after the Nova Scotia killings. He writes on Facebook, while I was up there moving around free, the words of George Floyd, I can't breathe, came to mind a few times. A stark contrast. He finished his post writing, end racism. So from a sign of solidarity in the skies to another on the ground, one that was deeply personal for a pair of siblings who, despite their shared upbringing, have lived some very different experiences. Maxim and Sophie spoke with our Ellen Morrow before they hit the streets just outside Toronto to explain why they wanted to march. And that's our moment. I grew up with um, Maxim and my sister. Obviously, uh, we didn't have the same skin color, but it just astonishes me how we grew up in the same neighborhood, same parents, same opportunities, yet so many things are so different just because of that one difference. Lately, I've been thinking like, if my brother goes outside, do I have to worry about him not coming home or about him being judged just because of his skin color? Well, I feel like I have a lot of hope. Um, I feel like we have a lot of room to where we can impact a lot of people, change their mindset or make sure that whatever their mindset is, it has no impact on our communities. We don't want this to be a parade where people forget about after. We want this to be something where people remember and as soon as they go home, they just want to do more. 
And I feel like this is just one step of the way and people need to continue and build off of this. That's what I call wisdom. Um, you know, how, how, how remarkable and, and strange it must be for them to be so close to each other and yet so far removed from each other's struggles. It must be eye-opening and, and heartbreaking at the same time. And you know, I, I, you get the sense that Sophie and Maxim have a lot to say. I, I'd certainly like to hear a lot <laughs> more from them and I have a feeling we absolutely will. Mm. That is a national for Thursday, June 4th. Good night. Good night.